Uh, my name is Per Cromwell, and for the last 10 years I've been trying to figure out how to tell a good story. Uh, I did this for... Ah, yes, no, of course. Um, most of the time I worked with uh, my cousin, Thomas Massetti, and we had this company, Studio Total, which we were running for 10 years. The last five years were more organized, but five years organized was pretty much enough for us, so then we decided to close it down. So now I started a new company called The Tale Studio that will keep on trying to figure out what makes a perfect story. Uh, I don't talk that much about storytelling. I've been doing it for a long time. So I, I did some research now before this lecture. And there's like, I think just the last three months or a couple of months, there have been 40 books being released on Amazon on the topic storytelling. And that's just in the communication uh, category, and there are already 887 books in that category. There are basically storytelling for everything. There's basically there's also storytelling for lawyers, which I'm not sure if that's a good thing. Maybe if there's also storytelling for attorneys, I think that's, there's like limits to this. Uh, it seems like a lot of people argue that storytelling is the solution to basically any problem you could possibly imagine. Uh, and when you start looking into this, this is a lot of the things that you see. What's your story? And these books are very much about how you should tell your story. But we think that that is the wrong approach, because people don't really are that interested in hearing your story. You have to do something else. So this is not really how we see storytelling as telling our story or telling any story for that matter. So, but I will talk more about that later on. Uh, before we actually look forward or, and talk about what's currently going on, I think I need to make a very short recap of how we ended up where we are now. Uh, and basically, long time ago, then you could actually interrupt people and ask them to listen to whatever you had to say. Or actually, you didn't do the, the interruption yourself. You paid someone to interrupt their audience, and that worked quite well. It worked so well, actually, so a lot of companies and brands, they started spending more money, actually, on interrupting people than coming up with really good products or good solutions. And I think that this worked very well for some years, and that this is a new idea that I actually got yesterday when I was doing part of this presentation. I think when... I think the, the, this system peaked, the efficiency of this interruption methodology worked until the remote control was invented. And I call this the death by remote principle. And that is basically when you give people power to, without basically any effort, switch. If there is something that you don't like, then you switch it. Then if you watch something, it's a commercial break, you switch the channel, and then after a while you switch back. If it's still commercial, then you switch back. If then there's a new commercial break where you are looking at the moment, then you kind of find your way around these commercial breaks. Uh, and even before the remote control actually was invented, I think actually it was invented in, in the late uh, 19th century, but even before, people did not really want to see commercials. Uh, this is uh, Sam Pedroca. He is an environmental planner at the sanitary department of Los Angeles. And he could, he'd said that he could actually see in the system when people went to the toilet in the commercial breaks in the system, they could actually monitor that. Uh, so already before the re remote control, people tried to avoid watching commercials or paid messages. This is actually Sam himself doing some planning or is doing something there. I don't really know what that is. I, I think uh, a good image, or at least how I see it, is it's not an accident that we're here where we are right now. I think uh, this is actually a result of a compulsive behavior or usage of commercial messages. There was, they, did, they changed the lighting system, the street lights at the parking lot outside of a stadium in the US somewhere a couple of years ago, and they turned all the, instead of having the ordinary white bright lights, they had yellow light bulbs in, in the street lights. So when people exited 
the game and it was dark, no one could find their cars because basically ev every car looked the same color, the, all these brownish colors. So the first person took up their car keys and then they pressed their alarm button and the car blinked and made this honking sound and that worked quite well. And then more and more people started doing this and after a while all cars were blinking and honking and the whole system broke down. And if I would have been on that parking lot, I would have wanted to leave that horrible place but I couldn't have done that because someone would have told me, no, this is your home, this is where you're going to live, this is, this is, you can never leave this place. And in order to survive in this horrible environment of blinking and honking, I would have had to come up with a system to filter out or block this honking and blinking, otherwise I would go insane. And this is basically what's happening right now, that people don't really watch anything. This is heat cameras measuring how people watch on websites. And what you can see is that they're very efficiently blocking out any commercial or paid messages. And sometimes you cannot really avoid these uh, disruptions or, or these distractions. They're just in your face. But Kindly enough, you, you only have to wait five seconds, and then when it goes to three, two, one, then you could skip the ad. And that's basically the big shift now. Either you're part of the content or you're part of the distraction. And this is a system that works quite well, and especially like when I watch YouTubes with my kids, if I don't immediately click on skip ad, they ask me if, if I'm stupid. Uh, and that could only be like a couple of seconds, but they immediately just skip everything. And I don't even think that they watch the commercials, they just like watch the countdown. Uh, so basically, what, where are we now? We're back where the battle is not between the company or brand who has the biggest marketing budget anymore. It's basically the, the battle is between having the best idea, the best product, and having a story that people are willing to share. If you don't have that, then you're out. What is this? Ah, this is the animation. Uh, so, what I was starting out with was a little bit this, that a great story is not actually what you tell someone. A great story, or being good at storytelling, is actually to design and to craft a story that people tell other story about what you did. It's not what you tell people that you did. You actually have to do it. Otherwise, it doesn't really work, because people don't really listen to what you say. They want to see you do things. So basically what we could see in this heat map thing, where people kind of avoided the, the commercial messages and was focusing on the content, is that this is a left column, right column world. You need to be in the left column, otherwise you are going to get filtered out. So the first thing is that you have to do something for real, otherwise you will not be able to make it into the left column. And once you are in the left column, then, of course, then, then people, they, they have their own filters, of course, deciding what to click on. And that is some, something that we cannot really do that much about, because what's relevant to people, that changes from day to day, what's relevant one day is not relevant the other day, but if you're not in the left column, at least then you're not up for selection. So once you're there, you have to create something that's remarkable, that's amazing, that's weird, funny, some way standing out. And when we were in trying to promote an invention lab like a year ago, we created a story where we invented this flying carpet for dogs. Uh, we were actually planning to do it for humans, but it turned out being far too dangerous because the magnets are so strong, so they could kill humans, so we skipped that. So we kind of kept it very small. Uh, but, but just doing this small little thing of this flying carpet, we didn't even really got it to work that well. We actually, as you saw in the last slide, we, it worked a little bit. But as long as you say that this is a work in progress, this is something that we're working on, People kind of like it because you're doing it for real. And you don't even, and I mean, people like scientists and inventors, but people love crazy inventors. So coming up with these things is very efficient if you want to stand out and you want to create some kind of relevance in the left column. This is another project we did. 
when we kind of designed a story for a company who was selling dog food, and what they wanted to tell everyone was that they really like dogs, and they wanted to understand dogs, and they wanted to really know the dog's inner thoughts. So what we did then is that we created a device called No More Woof, which translates the thought of a dog into English. And you don't even have to be like a scientist to come up with these things. We actually just bought some EEG sensors, which is like you could buy them everywhere nowadays. Uh, we mixed them with some microcomputing and a speaker. And then we told the story about this device. Uh, and we made this like a global news story. And then everything came back here. And because everyone was looking at this, then also the Swedish media started looking at this, and everyone all of a sudden started to look at this. And this was just like a small story that we created that carried a message of wanting to understand dogs better. And that is something that could never have been achieved by an ad or something like that. This is from a new Saturday device Night Live. Is being developed that could translate a dog's thoughts into English. It's ideal for anyone who wants a device that's constantly saying <laughs> They're actually being produced right now. We're going to sell them. Uh, or you could make something that's like standing out because it's like the biggest in the world. You could like make something that's spectacular. Uh, another assignment that we had a long time ago, that was a, a Swedish fashion brand. They wanted to tell the story about their superior offer for Father's Day. And their orig original plan was to talk about underwear and ties. Everyone else is doing that. That's not really like a perfect offer for Father's Day. So instead, we created the biggest iPod speaker in the world called Wall of Sound. And we built it like for real, and it was working. It sounded probably more than good, but it was actually working. We built it, and it was up for sale. We presented it in a proper way. Uh, the big thing is that this was not an ad space or a 3D rendering. It was actually something real that people could talk about, which they did. A lot of people talked about this wall of sound, and they tried to, in different ways, explain how big it was. It was like biblical proportions. It was humongous. It was this huge speaker. And then in Forbes India, they also tried to describe it, and they described it like this. The size of a small woman. That's like super weird. Uh, <laughs> but they did that. And then, of course, we took the story back to Sweden. And then, of course, what gets big abroad when it comes to something driving from Sweden, then it gets big in Sweden. And all of a sudden, people start talking about this Father's Day offer that we did. Also, like a very small thing, not paying to get attention, but actually forcing yourself into the left column and creating real content. Um, this is just we did recently. This is a shotgun shell that is, uh, you could seed with it. It's like flower seeds in it. Uh, which is like, w the, like, when you do these things, wonderful things could happen, like flowers could start to bloom. Weird things also happen, like a security company from Miami called us asking, was how much damage you could look upon if you fired poppy seeds at burglars because they wanted to go green. This is super weird. <laughs> that was not our intention, so we did not like sell anything to them at all. Yes. Uh, so this is like one way of standing out in the left column. Another way to stand out is the social proof aspect or the herd mentality, which is like to make it short. Basically, if you walk down the street, you see one people looking up, then maybe you look up. You walk down the street, you see 10 people looking up. OK, most likely you will look up. If you walk down and everyone is looking up, then you will most likely also look up. And that is basically what's working over and over again when you're like clicking on things on YouTube, you read about things, you see things online. That is, like, if other people are looking into something, then most likely you will also start looking into it. What is it that everyone is looking at? And you could actually create these, this impression or illusion of that everyone is looking by doing like this, for instance. No unintentional pause on, on Ulva Maria Thompson here, but we wanted people to look at the pension system of Austria. No one was really looking at that, 
and we wanted the politicians and the media to look about that. The pension system is like going down, and we wanted people to talk about it. So what we did is that we found that we figured out like a good solution for this. We figured out that we could have, we started a sex school because if Austrians are bad at sex and if they get better at sex, they will have more kids. More kids means that the problem will fix itself in due time. So we started a, a, this school. Uh, this is the headmaster, Ulva Maria Thomson. We made commercials, websites, everything. Then we started to tell the story, but we wanted people outside Austria to look at it. So we sent it to Japan and they looked at it and they thought it was funny. Then, uh, un <laughs> intentionally, a lot of Indish people, Indian people, they started looking at it and they started to apply and they all wanted to become teachers at this ISOS, the International School of Sex. Uh, American started looking at it and, and then the French started looking at it. And Has your partner ever told you that you're kind of... German started looking at it and then we took it back to Austria and say, hey, the whole, wor the whole world is looking at this sex school and the pension system and then of course the Austrian media also had to look at it and then they started writing about it and we had a discussion about the pension system and that's because we made everyone look at this. But basically we didn't address our key target group to start with. Uh, the same thing, the first thing that we ever did actually was the same thing. We wanted politicians to acknowledge that there is a problem with the culture. There is like not enough discussion and money going into cultural things. But they were not looking into this. So what we did is that we wanted, and of course knowing that politicians, they look at what are the media looking at and what are the public looking at. So we uh, started a political party. We invited cultural celebrities. Uh, held a press conference. It was uh, when they did a poll in uh, Aftonbladet, they said that 11.9% could vote for the cultural party. Uh, the leaders of the uh, other political parties that we wanted to talk about this got super freaked and started talking about, oh, there's no need for a cultural party because we have our own cultural policy. And so they tried like to meet the threat. And all of a sudden, everyone was talking about culture. And this was, even though we had this super silly party, this is like the Minister of Defense, is this, it's Ulle Jungström. And he said that he wanted to be the Minister of Defense because he always wanted to drive a tank. So this was like completely like weird, <laughs> but, but still, everyone talked about it. So now everyone kind of, they, they saw what you did, they heard you out, they kind of, they listened to your message. And how do you get them to then retell your story? Because that's the key. There's like, of course, by being funny and being like doing these kind of weird stuff that I showed you before, people could start talking, but sometimes that's not enough. And then you could, one, one example of how we could like create these viral things is that we create like a fight. We try to lurk out enemies and we try to get people to discuss. Um, this is, let's see here. Ah. This is Gudrun Schumann. She's the leader of the feminist party. No. Ah, here she is. Uh, a lot of people like her and a lot of people don't like her, but and they had this like great idea of how to fix the problem with unequal wages. Men earn 100,000 kroner more every minute combined in comparison to the Swedish women. Uh, we wanted people to talk about that and foremost we wanted people to get upset because if someone is upset, you then you try to kind of gain fans to support your side of the argument and you try to oppose everyone else. That is something that's engaging people and people start sharing the story. What we did is that we took 100,000 kroner, we burned it and then we sent it to... Uh, yeah, it became a, a big story. And then exactly what we wanted happened that 99% of everyone who is writing these comments on Aftonbladet, for instance, they hated it. They, all the net haters, they came crawling out. Everyone thought that this, a lot of people thought that this was a really horrible thing to do. What, the one that we really wanted to target with this was all the people that could kind of liked Gudrun, but not really openly supported her. And when they had to pick sides, either on the sides of this angry, white middle-aged men or the, the feminists, most people tended to go towards the feminists. So all of a sudden they got like several thousands percent more members because people had to pick sides in this uh, fight that we created uh, before we 
the, they didn't have any money, so Thomas and I donated the 100,000 to them. So what we did is that I, I sat there, like a weird thing happened. I, I was like wrinkling these bills, and my phone uh, called, and it was a journalist from the Berlingske newspaper, a Danish big newspaper, prominent newspaper. They wanted just to run some facts before they printed the article. They just wanted to make sure that Gudrun Schumann, the leader of the feminist party, was going to eat 100,000 kroner. <laughs> and then I said, no, that's, that's not what's going to happen. But that's like, that would have been such a brilliant story. Uh, but, it's the, but the meaning of eating money is completely different from burning money. And I don't really know what that would have kind of said. Um, and basically, when, when I think what, I'm sh what kind of stories that I share myself, basically it's always about things that happens in reality. It's like things that happens in my world. Uh, so if you want to be perceived as innovative, then you have to do something innovative. This is an indoor cloud that we cr uh, built for a Swiss, Swiss furniture uh, manufacturer. Uh, it's also a lamp and a weather station. Uh, but this is like a, also a way of proving that you're innovative. You cannot just say it. This is like the big shift. When this story circles YouTube, then this, which is basically a commercial for, for uh, the furniture brand, it starts with a pre-roll, and it counts down to five, four, three, and then skip ad, and then people skip that ad, and then they go basically go to our ad, which we kind of probably spent much less money uh, to produce because we just built this cloud. Um, so basically, this is a new currency, so to speak, because you cannot buy uh, attention anymore. You need to deserve it, and you need to pay with like a good product, a good idea, and also to engage people into sharing your story. Uh, one last thing, because I'm running over time here, is that basically all the stories that we've created over the years is based upon, I don't think that there's like one single that's not has like one aspect of humor built into it. Uh, we wanted to make a point. This is like a very versatile thing that you could use. You could use it for, for like creating awareness on, on political issues, for brands, for democratic problems or, or whatever. In this case, we wanted to make a point that the Swedish Democrats are not really fit to rule this country because they, they are like stupid. So we, uh, we wanted to clarify if they really liked Muslims. So we called them asking them, are you willing to hold up signs saying that we love Muslims? And they said, no, we're not going to do that. So we called them again and said that we was a French television team, asked them if they could hold our logo, which was these like uh, letters. And so they, and they, it was very fun. They could like hold this and then, then we put it together, this, and it says, we love Muslims. <laughs> um, so, uh, so basically this is like one way that you could, this is like something that you could use like in a lot of different ways to make like, make your point in, in different aspects. Uh, but stay out of the right column, go into the left column and be like amazing. And then probably you could all be on CNN within a couple of weeks if you just manage to do that. So, and yeah, this is the new thing that I'm doing, the Tail Studio. It, we just launched it, so there's no one there. So if you go there, you will be among the first. Thank you.